Welcome to this week's episode of The Mixtape with Scott. I am the host, Scott Cunningham, professor of economics at Baylor University in Waco, Texas. Uh, I had to take a couple of weeks hiatus inadvertently. Uh, ended up just kind of painting myself into a corner. Couldn't get a lot of work done, and and I'm trying to get it back on track. Um, this week's interview is with a colleague of mine, Peter Klein. He's the uh, W.W. Carruth Endowed Chair uh, at Baylor University. He's not in the economics department, though. He's in the entrepreneurship department. And I wanted to have him on the show uh, for a couple of reasons. One, um, Peter's actually kind of part of my own story. Um, I, when I was picking schools, uh, to apply to school, I only applied to Emory and the University of Georgia. And they were all kind of because I could see these faculty members and they were working on things I was really passionate about. And um, like a lot of people, I was really passionate about new institutional economics. That was work by Ronald Coase, Doug North, and um, Oliver Williamson. And Peter had written this uh, kind of a explainer uh, article for an encyclopedia on new institutional economics. And I went over that article with a highlighter and a pen and paper uh, like it was the Bible. And I just uh, found it so fascinating. But unfortunately, uh, Peter left right when I got there. Um, he ended up going to Mizzou. And so I never got a chance to study with him. Uh, and I know if he had stayed given the, the the chemistry I had with Peter, he's just such a friendly, extremely funny uh, man, very, very thought provoking. Every conversation is just very deep and fun uh, that I would have loved to have, you know, taken courses from him. Um, but I also wanted to have him on the show probably because as some of you know, I sort of find these hooks um, these kind of narrative hooks. I mean, the, the concept of the show is to interview living economists and listen to their stories. And the idea being that, you know, we navigate our lives through stories. And you've heard me say that a lot. But it's also, I've got this second layer where, uh, you know, I don't just randomly pick people. I have these, in, I have my own personal interests. I like to think, though, I have a fairly general interest, but I do have my own interests. And and I kind of want to like, you know, flesh them out uh, with the guests. And, you know, one of the interests is the the econometricians. Another is the natural experiment, causal inference movement paradigm that moved through and, you know, won a couple of Nobel Prizes. Uh, Gary Becker's students, uh, economists that go into the tech industry. Those have all been like themes and I continue to flesh those things out. Uh, but one of them, too, is the Austrian economists. Um, I'm very interested in the Austrian economists, which is sort of one pole of the profession and or one of the poles of the history of the of uh, economics. And then um, this other pole is the uh, I guess it's oftentimes called the heterodox tradition. And, and one day I hope to kind of explore all that, too. And so Peter kind of he'll share he he is a very eclectic uh, kind of intellectual history. He went to the University of California, Berkeley, which he's going to tell you about, where he study, studied with uh, famed uh, Nobel laureate, at the time not a Nobel laureate, but became a Nobel laureate, Oliver Williamson, uh, sort of working on areas of uh, theory of the firm that and theories of organization that have to do with transaction cost economics, kind of Coasean ideas. But he's very much kind of, you know, a, as a young man had, had come into economics through that, through that, that door, that escalator, uh, that a lot of people come in through reading, uh, Austrian books. And, you know, that's one of the strengths of the Austrians is they wrote books, books that were readable by non-economists and they, uh, you know, th that's, how he got in and I wanted to talk to him and I'm going to interview a few more Austrians this season just to kind of continue to sort of flesh that out uh, of the more senior people in the profession. But Peter is, is his own man uh, is his own kind of intellectual. He's been on his own intellectual journey. Uh, he, now he's come 
back in my life as a, not a colleague in the econ department, like I said, but he's in our entrepreneurship department. So I'm going to turn it over to my, me, uh, I'm going to, and have uh, myself uh, start talking to Peter Klein, uh, professor at Baylor University. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you enjoy this, uh, send it to somebody. All right. See you in two seconds later. Well, it's a pleasure to have on the show a colleague of mine and someone that I've known for uh, quite a long time, Dr. Peter Klein. Peter, thanks so much for being on the show. Hey, Scott, thanks for having me. I've been a fan of your show for a while, and it's a pleasure to be a guest. Well, can you, for the sake of the listener, tell us your name, full title, and the name of the firm that pays your salary? Sure. I'm Peter Klein. I'm on the faculty at Baylor University, like Scott. And I'm the W.W. W. Carruth Chair of Entrepreneurship and currently serving as Chair of the Econo uh, Chair of the Entrepreneurship <laughs> Department. I'm having a bad day. Chair of the Entrepreneurship Department at Baylor. Uh, so at, at, uh, at the business school at Baylor, we have all the usual departments like most business school have. Most business schools have many have econ, of course, all have management, marketing, finance, accounting, information systems, et cetera. But we also have entrepreneurship as a department. Uh, the reason I'm I'm flubbing my lines here is because I got my PhD in economics, yeah. and so I identify my sort of core discipline as economics. But I'm a professor of entrepreneurship at Baylor. Yeah, but what's the deal? If I if I poke you and you bleed, are you going to bleed economist blood, or are you going to yeah. bleed entrepreneurial blood? You know, it's an interesting question. I suppose the easy answer would be to say that. These are it's not an apples to apples kind of comparison because uh, economics is sort of a core academic discipline like yeah. psychology or sociology or political science or whatever. And entrepreneurship like management or marketing or finance is more of an applied professional field. So, mm -hmm. so you know, if you think of entrepreneurship as a domain then entrepreneurship research draws on economics, yeah. which is probably more on economics than anything else. But there's a lot of entrepreneurship research that also, you know, that draws primarily on psychology or sociology or some other discipline. I mean, I think maybe some of our friends in, you know, philosophy or mathematics or biology might question whether economics is really a core discipline, yeah. whether, mm -hmm. you know, they might quibble about the social status of the social sciences per se. But I guess yeah. the point is, I don't really see a contradiction here because I think one can use economics tools as well as tools from other disciplines mm -hmm. to study the phenomena of entrepreneurship, just like you could study the phenomena of, you know, financial markets or whatever from a variety of disciplinary perspectives. Right, 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 right. So you don't, you don't really self-identify kind of like it's your identity. You don't really self-identify and say, I am an economist. That's never been kind of your, your personality. I'm wondering now well, if I'm, if I'm different. You know, it's a good question, Scott. I, I, the way I think of it is, you know, it's a little bit like the question of, you know, what is an academic field anyway? And mm -hmm. there's, kind of, you know, there's like an intellectual inward looking definition of a field or a person in a field based on, you know, what techniques they use and what methods of inquiry they think are appropriate and what theories and constructs they rely on, et cetera. But mm -hmm. there's also kind of a institutional sociological definition. I think in the history of science literature, they call it communities of practice. So mm -hmm. that would be like, you know, what conferences do you go to? Which right. people do you hang out with? What journals do you typically send your stuff to? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I for the early part of my career, I went primarily to, you know, the American Economic Association and maybe the Southern Economic Association and some other economics conferences. I still go to those from time to time, but I primarily mm -hmm. go to conferences that are more in sort of management and entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. I primarily submit my articles to to journals in that area. So if you ask, what do I identify as? Well, the people I hang out with mostly would consider themselves entrepreneurship professors yeah. or management professors more than economists. Mm. But if you say, well, what, you know, what am I in terms of how do I think about formulating a problem? I'm probably more like an economist than anything else. Yeah, that's really interesting. That sociological uh, community that you belong to reinforcing your personal identity as a particular kind of scientist i hadn't really connect i guess i took it for granted that i was an economist first and then go into those places but that's really kind of interesting 
Well, let's start with an icebreaker and get started. So what's a vacation that you went on as a younger person? Doesn't have to be a kid, but maybe, you know, in the past that to this day, maybe it's not your favorite vacation, but you've noticed that you've thought about it since you went. Oh, wow. Boy, that is a great question. Um, hard to think of a standalone vacation. So I grew up near the Smoky Mountains in Eastern mm. Tennessee. And so I spent a lot of my vacation time in the mountains, mm. either camping or hiking, or basically, you know, like at a cabin, uh, you know, hanging out in the woods and doing outdoorsy kind of stuff. Um, mm. So that certainly had a big influence on me. Although also I had um, uh, some relatives in South Florida and so we used to go to the Miami, Fort, Lauder Fort Lauderdale area, you know, 70s, 80s, when it mm -hmm. was really starting to become, uh, you know, built up into this giant megalopolis, you know, that it is now. But that was so, it was very socially and culturally different mm -hmm. because, you know, the joke about South Florida is that, you know, it's like closer uh, uh, culturally to New York than it is to anything geographically close to South Florida. That was mm -hmm. kind of a different experience, but also mm -hmm. something that a lot of people don't know about me. And this is not exactly an answer to your question, but my mother's from the UK. She's from Scotland oh. and she grew up in a tiny little village, um, not too far from Edinburgh, Scotland. And we used to go there um, almost maybe every, every other summer when I was a kid. Oh, so that's wow. my summers, part of my summers in Scotland. And that was so different, mm -hmm. such a different world, especially in the pre-internet era uh, that, um, you know, that, that, that landscape and those people and that culture sort of, you know, tugs at my heartstrings that I, yeah. I've never been able to master a proper Scottish dialect. Yeah. Yeah. That's hard. I went to Sterling last summer and the taxi driver drove me back to the airport and I was, we'd be talking and then like, just suddenly I had no idea what he was saying. Yeah. <laughs> I remember, I remember as a kid, I, 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 I can't remember where we were, some museum or something. And I got separated from my parents and apparently was in a place where I wasn't supposed to be. And the security guard comes out and starts yelling at me and questioning me. And I literally could not understand. Some of it might've been fear, but his accent, his Scottish brogue was so strong. And of course he didn't believe me that I didn't understand him. Right. He thought I was scamming to try to get out of being in trouble, which only made it worse. But <laughs> Scott, I, I'm glad you went to Sterling, but really the true test of your Scottish ancestry is, you know, after you watch the movie Braveheart, uh, yeah, you, you have to up a mace or a sword and go kill some English people. <laughs> you know, if not, then you're not a true Scotsman. Yeah, no, I the I, I basically played the type the whole time with the, the taxi driver. I just asked him about Braveheart the whole time. And <laughs> you could tell he was like easy way to get the conversation. He's the, is only the thousandth American that's done that to yeah. him. And, and like uh, every Hollywood movie, a hundred percent accurate in every detail. Yeah, right. Exactly. I was like, I don't want to know the. The problems with it. I want you just to uh, validate that it's the best movie <laughs> ever. Uh, okay. Well, so you grew up in East Tennessee. Where in East Tennessee? I went to college at UT Knoxville. Yeah, that's where I grew up. Is in Knoxville. Oh wow. Oh, what's your dad? What's your mom and dad do for a living? Yeah, my dad was a history professor at UT Knoxville. Oh, my no mom way. was an attorney. So oh. we might have passed each other on the street at some point and not even known it. Yeah, totally, totally. Huh? Did you ever think about that you might that might be where you ended up or not really wanting to? I mean, I certainly thought about it because lots of people from, you know, my high school uh, went there as the obvious college alternative. I guess, you know, for me, because my dad worked there and because I've grown up there, I want to get a little bit farther. Yeah. Uh, go a little farther afield. I went to UNC Chapel Hill, which is not that far away. Yeah. You know, the map but was was but was really a different place where I could kind of be out on my own and yeah myself well so what kind of toys and games and stuff did you play when you were a little kid oh boy you know it's funny i was having a conversation with a friend the other day about how social attitudes towards health and safety have changed so much but i remember we used to have there's this infamous kind of a lawn dart they were called jarts that were famously banned by osha or whoever is in i don't know what 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 government agency would be in charge of this there are these big metal darts with a sharp pointed tip yeah. and you had you had this thing like a hula hoop you know a plastic circle that you would lay it on the ground yeah and then you would fling these heavy metal darts <laughs> and try to get them to land nose first in the circle but of course 
I don't know how many, I don't know how many people were seriously injured, you know, from jarts, but it, it must have been more than a few. But I, you know, like like a lot of, you know, nerdy kind of boys, I liked, of course, you know, Legos and you yeah. know, model building and model trains and all that kind of stuff. But I also played sports and rode my bike and did all the things that, you know, parents no longer allow their kids to do. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. So the, so when you were little, um, you know, did you have any did you ever, do you remember when you were little ever saying, well, this is what I want to be when I grow up, like, you know, before high school? What was yeah, it? You know, that, that's a great question. There's a lot of, a lot of uh, professions have, uh, what would be the technical term? You know, there's a kind of intergenerational heritability on the occupational side. There's probably a technical term for this that labor economists will know that I'm forgetting, but you know, how likely, how much more likely are you to become a a doctor or a lawyer or a, you know, uh, you know, airplane pilot or whatever, conditional on your parents also yeah. holding that occupation, whatever you call that. I mean, that, that coefficient is very high for academics. Yeah. Now, you know, is that, uh, you know, is it genetic? Is it environmental? I'm sure it's a combination of things, but what I would say is, you know, compared to friends and peers who, you know, who, who didn't have parents working in higher ed, you know, I was just a lot more comfortable you know, I knew what it was, or at least I thought I knew what it was. I had some sense of what it meant professionally to be a scholar, you know, so like my dad, you know, he, he did normal dad things like other parents, but, you know, he, he didn't clock in and clock out. Sometimes he worked from, he had a study at home filled with books and back in that day, you know, cigar smoke and pipe smoke. And he spent a lot of time reading and typing on a typewriter and, you know, his friends would come over and hang out. I got to go to a few academic conferences as a kid, you know, tagging along. So just that universe where people engage in reading and writing and arguing and lecturing and teaching, you know, it just, it seemed natural to me. Whereas, mm -hmm. you know, who knows? I don't know, uh, you know, piloting an, piloting an airplane did not feel natural to me because I'd never seen anybody do it, you know, up, mm -hmm. up close, like maybe I would have. If mm -hmm. one of my parents had been a you know commercial air pilot, so mm -hmm. certainly that has some impact on it. The way I would put it is, you know, when I went to college, I certainly didn't have a career plan mapped out, mm -hmm. but you know, I thought you know I enjoyed college, and of course, you know, I had summer jobs, you know, working in offices and doing manual labor and doing all kinds of stuff. And I thought, well, I'm happy to do those things to make some money, but I don't feel like I really enjoy them all that much. But I kind of do enjoy school. I mean, I like doing the things that you do as a student. And I thought, yeah. okay, well, maybe I'll go to grad school because that just seems like more of doing something that, you know, feels kind of natural and I enjoy mm -hmm. doing. It's not like I really ever sat down and mapped out mm -hmm. an academic career. In fact, I was pretty naive, um, uh, surprisingly naive about, you know, like, how did it work? How do you get a job? How do you get tenure? How do you get published and all that. I mean, my dad was in a totally different academic field and he right. was, he was a bit older than the average, like he was in his forties when I was born. So, mm -hmm. I mean, his own experience of going to graduate school and getting a job and getting tenure was very different from what yeah. I would experience. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of jumped in and I thought, Oh, I like doing this stuff. And I like reading this and reading that. And I'll just keep doing it until I think of something better to do. And you know, something better to do never came along. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So here I am. <laughs> in high school, what, what subjects were you gravitating towards? What classes did you really like? Yeah. I mean, I went to a, you know, a, 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 a decent large public high school, but it wasn't like an elite magnet school or private school or college prep school. And I had some good classes and, you know, they had all the AP kinds of classes with a lot of smart kids. Yeah. Um, I don't think I really had a specialization in anything. Like there wasn't like an economics program. I think we had some kind of an econ course, but it was basically like, you know, how to balance your checkbook. Your check there, wasn't, there wasn't any really real academic content to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it really wasn't until I went to college. Um, I, so in high school, like a lot of people of my generation who gravitated towards kind of what we we would now call libertarian or classical liberal kind of ideas, yeah. I started reading Ayn Rand, which was introduced to me by a friend, and I mm. found her uh, I found her novels very interesting and you know intellectually stimulating and, and, and all that. And you think she, you were primed for that kind of philosophical literature? Were you already reading? 
heavy literature or philosophy oh, type gosh. stuff? I don't know. I mean, maybe a little bit heavier than the average high school kid, but not, I don't think I was especially attracted to, you know, super deep philosophical intellectual stuff. Yeah. I think like a lot of adolescent boys, I mean, it was the, you know, Ayn Rand's novels, not her nonfiction books, but her novels, you know, they appeal to this sort of, you know, bright kids who feel a little bit socially awkward and, you know, frustrated by some of what they see around him. This mm. kind of heroic individualism, the kind of romanticism, you know, in like the, I don't know, 19th century literary notion of romanticism you know, heroes doing great things and fighting against all odds to accomplish their goals single-handedly, you know, mm -hmm. that has a lot of kind of visceral, even kind of emotional as well as intellectual appeal. But yeah. the reason to bring that up is uh, I, I've read one of her nonfiction books called Capitalism, The Unknown Ideal, which actually has some pretty good stuff in it. And there's like in the back, there's like a list of recommended readings. So this is when I was still in high school. What and, year is this? What year uh, is this? So I graduated high school in 1984. So this okay. would have been early 80s. Right. And you know, she recommended books like Henry Hazlitt's Economics and One Lesson, mm. a book by uh, Ludwig von Mises called The Anti-Capitalist Mentality. I mean, mm. these, weren't, these weren't, you know, they're kind of like general interest yeah. books that a lay person could read. Yep. But I read those and I thought, oh, wow, these are really great. That was so high when, school. That was high school, yes. Yeah. So when yeah. I went to college... I said, well, I already think I, I feel like I know some economics. I mean, I probably really didn't know very much, but yeah. I thought I did. Mm -hmm. and so I, I, um, I, I took some, you know, I took all kinds of liberal arts classes. As some of your younger listeners may not realize the extent to which college has really changed. I mean, back in my day and maybe in your day too, Scott, people, you know, people really didn't have a major at all or didn't even know what they wanted to major in until, you know, end of the sophomore year, start yeah. of the junior year. You know, mm -hmm. now at Baylor, we get kids coming in first semester freshmen, and they're, you know, accounting majors, and they've already done a bunch of accounting in the summer and blah, blah, blah. So yeah. I was dabbling in a little bit of everything. And mm -hmm. I took some econ courses. And to be honest, the, the econ courses I took in college were not that great. Mm -hmm. but, but I found them super easy. Like mm -hmm. I could barely study and get, you know, 100 on the test or whatever. And I thought, okay, well, uh, maybe I'll end up majoring in this. Mm. I already feel like I know some econ on the side from my private reading. You and still that active probably helps me time? in these classes too. Are you at this time still kind of an active consumer of economic books and articles all outside of your classes? Yeah, I would say so. Uh -huh. um, you know, at that time. Consumer. Yeah. I mean, again, as, as a, as a college kid, um, I probably understood a small percentage of what I read, but I started to learn who people, you know, like Mises or or Hayek or Schumpeter or, mm -hmm. um, you know, Murray Rothbard. I started to read some of works by these people, which I found very exciting, even mm. though I had to totally understand everything that they were talking about. Yeah. And um, I, probably that's the reason I ended up as majoring in economics. I did like economics, but it wasn't that I loved my college classes so much mm. i just thought the area of study was interesting and i could do it just fine in college uh but i also enjoyed i mean enjoyed college classes i took in history psychology poli sci I, I guess i probably figured at that point that i didn't want to go into like a stem what we mm. are now calling stem discipline i think i did fine in chemistry and biology but um, I think I got kicked out of the chem lab because I violated some safety procedure and <laughs> causing a minor explosion or something. <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe the natural sciences are not for me. <laughs> um, well, did you have a community of, of other friends or, or like go to conferences or something where you were getting to talk to people that were sort of, you know, you could talk to about this yeah. more Austrian economist or the classical no. liberal? Yeah, not really in college. I mean, I must have known one or two folks who had sort of similar interests, but it was a pretty solitary, solitary endeavor back in those days. Again, this is pre-internet, yeah. right? So there's, you know, the, the, you. Could, I remember there were some, uh, you know, there were newsletters, you know, magazines that you could subscribe to and they would come once a month. You mm. know, you'd rush out to the mailbox and you'd grab it and you'd, you'd devour the contents of this thing you know, like an hour. And then it's, then you got to wait another 30 days, you know, to get the next one. So there mm. really wasn't a, a physical community so much, at least not one that I 
that I was aware of. A, a joke I like to tell is, you know, somehow I would hear about some book like, you know, like, like Human Action, the great treatise by von Mises that is very difficult to read for a beginner. And I'd rush off to the library. And, you know, th so this would have been late 80s, mid, mid to late 80s. I, I, you know, get that book from the stacks. I got to check it out. And back in those days, as you remember, you know, there was a little, uh, I don't know, we probably didn't have anything digitized back then. But, you know, there was a little, little slip of paper, a little card in the back of the book where, where you would, you know, they would stamp the due date. And so then, and then they would stick that card back in there. So you could see the history of all the times that book had been checked out. And I get these books and it's like, this book hasn't been checked out since, you know, 1954 or something. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I'm the only person in the world who has any interest in this stuff. But, you know, you felt like you were connected to history somehow, yeah. but like you were totally isolated in the present. So what, what happened to me, I'm kind of getting ahead of the story a little bit, but in grad school, that was when I first became aware of organizations and institutions mm. that existed that were interested in like the Austrian school of economics or libertarian theories and ideas. That's why I first started going to conferences and I first met other people mm. who had these shared interests. And that was kind of an eye opener. That was kind of a revelation to me because, you know, before that, uh, People like me probably thought um, I must be the only person on the whole planet, right? Who's right. sort of interested in this stuff? And again, not not to not to get into the cliche that we always old people like us always talk about. You know, well nowadays with social media, blah blah blah. But but it, it really is. You know, there are these online communities. Yeah, where you know not not to discount the kind of social pathologies that online, you know, uh, the, fo the the you know the virtual can cause. I've been reading some stuff about Jonathan Haidt's new book. Yeah. Which is getting a lot of attention, pro and con, you know, on social media and mm -hmm. depression among teenagers and so forth. But, 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 but the positive is that, you know, no matter what weird, obscure interest you have, or you think it's weird and obscure because nobody in your immediate face to face friend group is into it, yep. you know, with a few clicks, you can find, you know, a subreddit or, you know, a bunch of websites or, you know, an Instagram account, whatever, with tons of people who are really into that thing. But yeah. That really wasn't, we didn't have that experience back in the old days. Yeah. When I was um, a grad student, I had a scholarship from the Ludwig von Mises Institute. And I remember finding out that that Institute existed from, you know, from a flyer that was on a bulletin board mm. and sending off a letter. You know, I was like shocked that there existed an Institute. Yeah. You know, named after this guy. And I thought I was the only person who even knew who he was, you know, on the planet, still alive. Right. right. And so when I went and met other people who were into the same stuff, it's like, oh, okay, now I've found my, now if I'm found, I found my, my tribe. Right. But even back then the tribes didn't interact as frequently because you might see them once a year, or a couple of times a year, mm. you didn't exchange mail or, you know, phone calls. But again, it wasn't until I was already, an assistant professor, I guess, when the commercial internet, you know, became, became a thing. Yeah. Right. Uh, it's gotta be that those functions uh, of old conferences, probably that the current conferences are not necessarily building community community. Well, I mean, there is, I definitely have felt like some conferences did since I, that I had my community there, but it seems still like, the idea that I found my people is, I, I bet you that's more, is that more historically what you think those old conferences uh, were like? You know, that's a, it, it's a great question. I, I don't know if anybody in like sociology or cultural anthropology is doing research on this. It's a great, it's a fascinating research question. Mm. Like what is the community building function of something like an academic conference? Yeah. Or like a physical, you know, meetup today compared mm -hmm. to what it was in the past, because now it's got to be, you know, a complement to other kinds of yeah. online community building. It's not a substitute. Right. And, you know, of course, we all know there are certain things that you accomplish from face-to-face -face interaction, yeah. exchanges of tacit knowledge. And, you know, there's, it's a different kind of community building, Yeah. but again, but it's like, it's based on a foundation that you already, you know, maybe you kind of feel like you know the person because yeah. you interacted with them on 
Facebook or Twitter or something. Yeah. When you see them in person, you got to dinner together or you're in a session at a meeting together. Mm -hmm. That's completely a different form of interaction, but it's like you have this base already. Whereas yeah. maybe in the past when you might've read somebody's article or read their book, but it's you know, much more infrequent. I, you know, Scott, I'm, I'm reminded of the, um, some of your listeners may have heard of one, one of the most famous organizations like this of people with kind of a free market orientation was the Mont Pelerin Society, yeah. which was the first kind of free market intellectual organization. It was founded by, the initial meeting was organized by F.A. Hayek in 1947 in a, 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 at a retreat somewhere in Switzerland, a place called Mont Pelerin is how they got the name. But, you know, from what I understand, so this was the immediate, you know, post-war period. And, you know, from the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, we saw the rise of communism, the rise of fascism, the, the few intellectuals who identified as, I guess, what we would now call classical liberals, they would have just called themselves liberals. Mm -hmm. They were like a really small, entrenched minority. Most of them were professors at some, you know, or journalists or something at some place where they were the only, only person within a, you know, thousand kilometer, you know, radius. Mm -hmm. And I think when they all met at this meeting, there's only like 50, 50 or 60 people. Again, it was like a it was like a revelation to all of them mm. the fact that, that they could feel like they were part of a movement. Totally. So I guess maybe that's what it comes. Maybe it's another way to think about it is you know we all like to be part of something larger than ourselves. Yeah. And being part of what you think of as an intellectual movement, or maybe it's an activist movement or something, mm -hmm. you know that's that's very important for us building our identities. Yeah. And I think doing it in the flesh is different from doing it online. But totally. I, an expert in exactly yeah 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 that yeah means. i mean finding those people in the first place it's you know when they're when there's very little when there's a lot of search frictions i mean anything that can just sort of pop up and be like that society if word gets out you know it can just create so much coordination that's difficult to do otherwise you yeah. know well so you go to chapel hill you decide at some point uh, you're reading like Rothbard and you're reading von Mises and you decide, I want to, be I want to go to graduate school, right? You want to be a professor. So where I remember, you know, you, you sort of advising someone, I thought it was you where you were saying, you know, the most important thing is apply broadly and then go to the best school that you get into or something. I felt like I heard you one time say, does that sound like yeah. something you would have said? Well, I would put it this way. I mean, first of all, there's no, you know, there's no one path that's perfect for everybody. But but I, I, what I tell my students, people applying to grad school, or people for that matter, applying for jobs out of grad school, you know, I mean, you need to be well informed about the trade offs. Yeah. Right? So one strategy for grad school is, you know, you want to study this specific thing with this specific person, right? You know, I want to be the causal inference guy. And I, my dream is to study with Co Scott Cunningham. And yeah. wherever Scott Cunningham is, you know, that's where I'm going because I want to study that specific thing. I mean, that's perfectly legit. That has yeah. a lot of advantages, you know, because you're going to the place where you're going to, or maybe there's a community of people who do that thing. Yeah. The, but, but there are risks, right? There are the right. risks. Like you, you, maybe you go there and, you know, Scott Cunningham leaves. Yeah. You know, he gets a job at some other school or, yeah. you know, it turns out Scott Cunningham's a jerk and, you know, you don't get along with them and he yeah. treats the students badly. And now you're kind of stuck. I think mm -hmm. this is more of a problem, by the way, in STEM, you know, where they have the lab model where a specific oh, yeah. faculty member is funding you. One of the yeah. things I like about, you know, fields like economics, entrepreneurship is our, our grad students are funded by the department. Mm. You're not tied. You know, you, maybe you went there because you especially like this one professor, but you're yeah. not tied to that professor. You're not you're not dependent on that professor for your well being, yeah. your livelihood. So, yeah. so uh, another model is, you know, apply to a lot of different schools and go to the best place that you get into, or yeah. maybe the best place you get into with full funding or something like that. Uh, again, you know, as, as you well know, there are no perfect solutions, only trade offs. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so the advantage of that model is you're not tied to one person. You have a variety of people to work with. And if you're going to the best school that you can get into, then you likely have the best odds on the job market. Yeah. Right. Because as, as we know, there, you know, there's a heck of a lot of 
pedigree and inbreeding and all kinds of, you know, pathologies in academia, mm -hmm. right? Where people look at letterhead rather than intrinsic quality. And maybe that's justified. That can be a subject for another day. But because that is, you know, it is that way, you mm -hmm. know, it's, it's easier to get a job with a PhD from MIT than it is with a PhD from Baylor or wherever. Yeah. Again, it, it, it's, it's an, it's, if you want to make a, a, a Keteris Paribus comparison, I also say it, it depends on the individual, right? So like imagine somebody who could get into MIT and could get a PhD at MIT, but would be miserable mm -hmm. and, you know, maybe you wouldn't enjoy it. There's nobody there you can relate to. And maybe your dissertation would actually be worse than it otherwise would be if you had gone someplace where you fit better. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, it's hard to say what's best for each individual. There's an individual fixed effect here that's hard to tease out, you know, when yeah. you look more, more broadly. Yeah. So I try to advise, I try to give advice to students, lay out all the options. Here are the pros and cons of different models you have to figure out what's best for you. And you typically only get one shot. Right. You know, we don't really have the transfer portal. I mean, I guess technically <laughs> we do, but it's right. like, have you ever, have you ever been asked, Scott? I, I am asked sometimes, you know, are you, are you glad you made the choices you did? Are, are, Scott, are you glad you went to Georgia for your PhD? Well, it's like, when I get asked that question, well, I can kind of speculate, but I don't know. I have one observation. Yeah, exactly. N equals one. I don't know how I would have done if I'd done something else. I don't yeah. really have a counterfactual. Yeah, totally, but, totally. Um, but but I, probably what you're getting around to is I personally chose the strategy of just going to the best, highest ranked school that I could get into mm. because I figured it would give me more job market opportunities. I did. I won't mention the names, but I did... Um, well, I guess I will mention the names. I, you know, there there were some prominent, you know, Austrian economists, or even today prominent Austrian economists, like Israel Kirzner, who mm -hmm. was at that time a professor at NYU. Yeah. Um, I was also interested in kind of history of economic thought. And the pr probably the best university at that time for studying history of economic thought was Duke University. Yeah. I sure. applied to both Duke and NYU. I got admitted to both Duke and NYU. Mm -hmm. I interviewed and met the folks and i mean this is probably a, a, a lot of uh, you know inappropriate arrogance on my part but i remember i met israel kirzner i went up to nyu and inter, you know interviewed looked around and i met some of the other faculty and i thought gosh this place is great but you know i don't want to get my phd here i would rather be a professor here yeah and to be a professor here, I probably can't get my PhD at NYU. Another guy who I'm still friends with, Mario Rizzo, was uh, a colleague of Kirzner's and also an Austrian school economist. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if I said this to him or if I was just thinking it, but he got his PhD at Chicago. Mm. And then he was running the Austrian program at NYU. And I'm thinking, well, if I want to be somebody like you, I need to get a PhD at someplace like Chicago so then yeah. I can go to NYU. Again, you know, the, the hubris of youth is, is, is always kind of fun. Yeah. But, but that was kind of my mentality. Sure, I, sure. I, I need to go someplace a little bit better than the places I want to end up. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you know, the best place that I got into was Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And um, so Berkeley was where I decided to go. I also had, my older brother was living in the San Francisco area at that time. So, you know, I had, I had some family in that area and of course it was California and it sounded mm -hmm. really cool and fun and um, the, the Mises Institute also had an office in the San Francisco area in, oh. in a little office park down near the San Francisco airport in town called Burlingame. So, so I knew if I went there, I would have a family member nearby and I knew I would have some other you know, kind of intellectual comrades in the area mm. even if they weren't in the PhD program with me. Mm -hmm. um, and it was also a very large PhD program as it still is today. So I figured... You know, I would get along with at least some of the folks there, and 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 I certainly did. Well, did you go there, kind of knowing that Oliver Williamson was there, or is it like a complete blank slate? You just know it's a fantastic program. Yeah. No, I didn't know who Oliver Williamson was. Okay, the guy who ended up being my uh, advisor. Yeah. Um he, he actually came to Berkeley right around the same time I did um, from Yale, and mm. um, I didn't know his work at all, but. Um, they had Berkeley had this thing where because it was a large department, uh, gosh, it must have been 25, 30, 40, maybe, maybe more, 40, 45 faculty. 
big PhD program. So you didn't really know who everybody was. Right. And they had they had these little for first year PhD students, they had little brown bags where like every week professors representing a different field of study would come and introduce themselves and introduce their field. So, you know, the labor economists would come one week and they would talk about the labor econ field. And then the macro economists would come and the international economists would come, whatever. And so, and one of those was for institutional economics. Oh. And Williamson, because Berkeley was offering a field sequence in institutional economics. New and institutional Williamson, or the traditional? I mean, they just, well, I mean, it, it was what we would now call new institutional, but I think at that time they just called it institutional. It had I a brand called, already at that point. It was kind of a school. So uh, that's a good question. I mean, Williamson call Williamson's PhD course for second year students was was just called Economics of Institutions. Oh, it was an IO. So I mean, he no, there was also an IO sequence, he which did, I, which he I had a separate PhD yeah, he had a, sequence. That's right. He, well, he had a course, and Berkeley had a field in the Economics of Institutions, oh. separate from the Industrial Organization sequence. Wow. So yeah, I guess the IO guys must have come and presented one day, and that would have been um, uh, Joseph Farrell, Michael Katz. Um, who else would have done IO at that time? Um, maybe Benjamin Hermelin, who's now the provost at Berkeley. Uh, uh, Richard Gilbert, um, uh, and then but then Williamson also did a separate. So Williamson's presentation was not IO; it was economics of institutions. There's mm -hmm. an interesting story, by the way. I don't know if we have time to get into it. Which uh, some of which I've only recently learned about. Uh, the, the reason, the short answer is, the reason that Williamson came to Berkeley was because he was trying to establish, you know, a program, an initiative, an institute, a center. I don't know what you would call it. It wasn't the, the physical manifestation wasn't as important as like the intellectual community yeah. to, to, to promote what he called the economics of organization or the economics of institutions. You know, nowadays, um, you know, NBER has an organizational economics mm -hmm. um, working group. And that's a, you know, a subject category. But at that time, there was no such thing. Yeah. And Williamson had tried um, uh, in both at Penn and at Yale to establish like an organizational economics thing yeah. without success and he was frustrated mm -hmm. by a lot of pushback that he got at Yale so at what apparently what happened at Yale is that people in sort of organizational sociology um what what in in oh. business in, in the management field what we now call organizational behavior yeah the organizational behavior field which is mostly sociologists and psychologists mm -hmm. they they would not give up control of the study of organizations to the yeah. economists. Right. Or, or Williamson is a very interdisciplinary kind of a guy, but he wanted economics to be part of that conversation mm. and he was buffed. And so he came to Berkeley with the promise that he would be able to create some kind of, you know, again, institution or organization to study institutions and organizations. Wow. It was partly funded by the econ department, partly by the business school, the law Did he school. he bring some faculty with him? Did he bring some faculty? So I think he he I, I think he must have come with the promise of getting to do some faculty hiring. Ah, but, but he only came as himself. Got it. Uh, he, had, he had a, a point. He had a multi, I think he had a triple appointment in the business school, econ department, and law. But anyway, wow. to get back to your question, um, so remember, I had this kind of idiosyncratic background. Yeah, you know, I was good enough at quantitative methods to do well in you know in all my undergrad courses. And, you know, in, in math and stat, as well as econ, even though it probably wasn't as technical in the mid 80s as it is, you know, in 2024. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, and so, you know, so as a first year student at Berkeley, you know, my classes are all, you know, math, econ and, you know, micro. I think we so we must have been taking micro, macro and econometrics. I did a summer. There was like a boot math camp, boot camp in the summer. And. You know, I was doing okay in all those classes. I was passing them. I was making satisfactory grades in all those classes, but I wasn't really enjoying them all that much. I mean, it was it was a you know hundred percent technique. Yeah, there's almost nothing about you know ideas and the big picture stuff or policy yeah. or that stuff. And right. I mean, I guess I kind of that was sort of what I expected. So my my mentality was I'm going to buckle up 
get through all this. And then as a more advanced student, then I can pursue stuff I'm really more interested in, which I guess a lot of students do. But when I, when I went to this little brown bag thing, Williamson handed out his syllabus, um, the syllabus for his course, which would be taken in the second year. So this, it was like a preview of what I would get in the next year if yeah. I took Williamson's course. And I still have a copy of that syllabus. I can share it with you for you to post if you want. Uh -huh. but, I mean, it was mind blowing for me because, you know, this was a Berkeley professor at the top of his game. You yeah. know, he would go on to win a Nobel Prize, as, as your listeners, I'm sure know. Yeah. Uh, but um, the syllabus was like, it was this really idiosyncratic mix of stuff. So there were there were all kinds of classic economics papers uh, not just by the standard authors that we were reading at the time, but also, of course, by Coase, Armin Alshin, Harold Demsetz, uh, Stephen Chung. Is Ostrom on there? Did, did you ever uh, notice? Uh, Ostrom, Ostrom was probably on there, too. I have to go uh -huh. back. But also, you know, Williamson. Because he seems like he knows her that day that they both win. I noticed that he, they, he, I don't know. It's, I got the sense that they knew each other a little bit. Is that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure that some of Ostrom's stuff was in our curriculum. She wasn't, it wasn't as large a part as maybe some other. Yeah. You know, it was more, more, it was more, Coase was more of a guy. Yeah. North. Um, but we read, you know, Kenneth Arrow's paper on information economics, which, mm -hmm. uh, um, but also Williamson was trained at Carnegie Mellon back in the, you know, 60s. And so we had stuff by, uh, you know, uh, Sire and March, who wrote a famous book on what, you know, sort of what would become behavioral economics. Oh. And there was like Oscar Morgenstern, early yeah. kind of theoretic stuff. Oh, but so there was he some comes political from science, there. there was some sociology, uh. there was all kinds of stuff. And I thought, okay, man, this is going to be interesting. And he had Hayek yeah. on there. And I thought, these are articles that I would just want to read for fun. Yeah. He didn't have to. Yeah. So I want to take this course. Mm -hmm. And so the the way they made it a field actually was um, you took Williamson's course, then you took a course in um, agency theory and mechanism design mm. with Ben Hermelin, which at that point was a little bit more avant garde. Now it's it, now it's more there's more of that in mainstream micro and a PhD uh, sequence. But, but back then this was this would have been 80, 88, 89, 90 around that time. A lot of this stuff was 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 um, quite a bit uh, newer. Mm. So we took Williamson's course, which had some technical parts, but wasn't really a heavily mathematical course. Mm. And then we took this course in mechanism design that was very mathematical. And somehow they bundled that into a field of study. So I did oh. that. I did the IO field oh. and, you know, passed all the exams, whatever, and then, then decided to write my dissertation with Williamson because I thought he was the most interesting guy on the faculty. Yeah. Well, how did that, how did y'all gel? What was he like as a, oh, an advisor? I mean, he was great, although he was, you know, uh, he, he was a, a, an older gentleman and he was kind of old school. I mean, not that he, he was friendly, but he wasn't touchy feely. He wasn't yeah. gushy. And it was a more formal kind of relationship than I think a lot of students are used to today. So right. it wasn't like, you know, weekly bull sessions in his office. It was mm -hmm. a little bit more structured, but he gave prompt you know, feedback and, um, you know, and very useful feedback on, you know, dissertation chapters and all that. Um, he, he didn't give great feedback on the job market uh, mm. because, I mean, it's, it's so interesting if you, if you read Williamson's biography, his autobiography, and you read more about kind of the milieu in which he uh, uh, came into the, you know, in which he started his career, obviously he's a super smart guy, but, you know, he, he was friends with everybody, mm. uh, all the elite scholars of that time. And, you know, he got his stuff published in all the elite journals and, you know, never seemed to have any career problems. And I think he just sort of assumed that that would happen for all of us, too. That, <laughs> yeah. you know, you just do you just do good work and all the everything <laughs> will sort of fall into place, which, of course, not how it happened. But I can tell you a joke <laughs> along those lines. There was another student. Um, a, a classmate of mine, but he was actually not in the econ department. He was in, I think he was in marketing, but he had Williamson as, a, as, a, as, as his advisor. And there was this deal where he, he was almost finished with his dissertation, but not quite. He went on the job market and he got a tenure track job offer at a good university, you know, with like an August one start date. And, but, but the condition was he had to have defended his dissertation, you know, by August 1st. And he was cutting it close. You know, it was like the summer 
and he was getting pretty far along, but not quite. And Williamson wanted more changes. And it was, you know, it was questionable whether he would make the deadline or not. And so he sends Williamson this email. I, I think, so he sends like what he is hoping is like the final draft uh, or like the all, next to final draft. And he sends it to Williamson, you know, with this email, I guess. And he says, so you know, here's what I've got. Um, you know, do you think I can finish by August 1? And Williamson writes back, uh, how did he put it? He said, oh, yeah, you, you could. Oh, no, no. So, I, I'm sorry. I, I Let me. It was Williamson sent him a list of corrections. That was it. Yeah. Williamson sends him this lengthy list of revisions. And so the guy writes back and says, do you think I can accomplish all these revisions by the deadline? That's the question. And a few days later, you know, the 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 cheeky, the tongue in cheek response comes back. And says, oh, yeah, um, I think you could do all these revisions by the deadline if you were the smartest person I've ever met. And I know Herbert Simon, I know Ronald Coase, I know Kenneth Arrow. He goes through this list of all like the super geniuses that he knows. And so the the, the punchline is the guy actually did do the revisions. And so every, we every, we always referred to him after that as the smartest person that Oliver Williamson, you know, ever met. <laughs> That's great. That's great. <laughs> um, so what'd you do your job? What was your job market paper? Yeah. So my dissertation was, uh, uh, let me actually uh, get that, get to that in a roundabout way. Even though I had these kind of idiosyncratic interests, mm -hmm. I wanted to do a, a, a slightly more mainstream dissertation, you know, again, just for kind of career purposes, yeah. not that I was doing stuff that I thought that I fundamentally disagreed with, but I, I, I you know, I, I positioned the research in a way that I hoped would seem reasonable to the typical academic economist. And I was planning to go on the econ job market. I mm -hmm. could have gone on the business school job market, mm -hmm. something like strategic management. In hindsight, that probably would have been a smarter career move, but I didn't know that much about that part of the market. I mean, I never took a single business course as an undergrad. Yeah. I mean, I didn't know what, ac mm -hmm. what business academics was. I had no idea. And I didn't know there was a field of like organization studies or business strategy, which is kind of the same stuff I was doing right. just differently, but I didn't know that existed. Anyway, so um, uh, my my dissertation was kind of a business history dissertation. I was mm -hmm. in, you know interested in organizations. And so I was studying the emergence of a particular kind of organizational form from like the 1950s to the present at that time, you know, to the 1980s. What Namely, was it? So, so what, so you had big, and if you look at kind of uh, Western business history, you're know, going through different phases, you had these um, large vertically integrated companies that emerged in the late 19th century, like Standard Oil and U.S. Steel, Alcoa, right? They were large manufacturing or in the case of oil, you know, extraction uh, businesses, refining businesses, but they, they were highly vertically integrated both backwards and forwards mm. so you know uh, uh, um you know uh, uh, alcoa was you know owning the mines where the aluminum was being mined and then they owned the all the different refining stages and they were producing finished aluminum and all that so the big mega companies that we think of for you know the robber baron era they were all highly specialized companies mm. they were sort of all in one industry and you had ones like, you know, J.P. Morgan or whatever, were all in finance as well as these kind of more industrial companies. Mm. What, what what began to emerge, uh, so, so you had these big robber baron companies in the late 19th century. Then in the 19 teens and 1920s, you began to see the emergence of more diversified companies like General Motors, right, which had was all in automobiles, but had these multiple different brands or lines and they were managed, you know, there's a famous book by Alfred Chandler, a couple of famous books by the historian Alfred D. Chandler Jr., one called Strategy and Structure, published in 1962, I think, and then one called The Visible Hand, published in 1977, which won all the awards, you know, like the, the you know, equivalent Pulitzer Prize for nonfiction and so mm. forth. You know, The Visible Hand, of course, being a play on, Adam Smith's invisible hand, Chandler argued that um, these large uh, multi-business companies 
were, you know, substituting what he called the visible hand of management and allocating resources across their different subsidiaries than the invisible hand of the market. So mm. in the 50s and 60s, you saw the rise of conglomerate companies that were like wildly diversified way beyond something like GM. Mm. You had companies that, you know, they had a bunch of different manufacturing concerns and they had service businesses and they were in, uh, you know, they, they had, they owned a bank and they owned an agricultural, uh, uh, you know, facility as well as, you know, heavy industry and so forth. They were like, you know, there was no kind of business focus at all. Mm. And I was really interested in these companies, not only from a purely kind of economic point of view, like, is there any economic rationale for them? Mm -hmm. And there were critics at the time who said, look, this is just kind of like, um, uh, you know, it's a way to get around like antitrust concerns. So if you tried to become, you know, a billion dollar company in that day by dominating one industry, you would fall afoul of the antitrust mm. uh, the policy authorities. So one theory was, well, these big companies were just gobbling up all kinds of unrelated businesses mm. so they could grow rapidly without dominating any one industry sector and uh -huh. therefore getting around antitrust concerns. Huh. And so what I was interested in, and other people had written about this, Williamson had written a little bit about it, but not studied it in a huge amount of detail, was, mm. you know, again, is there some economic efficiency gain from doing this mm. rather than just empire building right. or, you know, regulatory concerns? And so yeah. I, I did an empirical study of a, a set of large American conglomerate companies, uh, something that was also was, there was also an interesting political economy aspect to this because these big conglomerates, they were very... Um, they were outside to go back to our earlier conversation about community. They were at, they were not part of the old boys club. You mm -hmm. know, the big industrial concerns were all headquartered in the east, in the northeast, or you know, Pennsylvania in the case of steel. And you know, they were in all the gentlemen's clubs, and they were part of all the elite, you know, social social networks at the time. The conglomerate companies were headquartered in places like California and Texas, which were new states at that time. Their founders did not go to Harvard or Yale. Their mm -hmm. founders were not in the such and such club, you know, in Boston. They were not part of the old boy or old gal network. I guess it was mostly boys at that time, right? Mm -hmm. And so they were kind of political outsiders. And there was one sort of theory that held that the dominant incumbents at the time who were threatened by these conglomerate firms were trying to use the political establishment to sort of shut them down because mm -hmm. they, you know, they weren't part of the, they didn't lobby, they didn't have trade associations, they weren't friendly with the political authorities the way the old school companies were. So I did mm -hmm. this empirical study, you know, using techniques that, you know, in 2024 would be considered, you know, would not be the results would not be dispositive, let's put it that way, but mm. techniques that were reasonable sort of at the time. You and I have actually talked about this a little bit in another, in another context, but I did some kind of, um, you know, what's now almost like a diff and diff, kind of yeah. like a proto, it's like a pro, uh, a proto diff and diff kind of a model where mm. what I did essentially was I took this sample of diversified companies and then I constructed artificial kind of like pseudo companies as match as matched pairs mm. so, you know if, if the if the diversified company has subsidiaries and in industries a b and c you know 20 percent of its assets are in industry a and 30 percent are in b and 50 percent are in c i would take like randomly select a standalone company in industry a with some other matching criteria applied as well a standalone company in industry b standalone company in industry c then construct a weighted average of their performance outcomes using the the weights corresponding with the relative size of that yeah. business in the diversified firm's portfolio. And That's then basically fine. just compare the two. Yeah. And I also looked at some regulatory and sort of industry shocks to mm. see if the difference between the sample firms and their pseudo conglomerates was different before or after these shocks. It's a, again, a li it's a little bit like synthetic control. Yeah, it sounds like it. synthetic control, but you know, it, algorithmically, it's not exactly the same. And there was more manual construction mm. than, than the way we would do it today. But kind of, you know, intuitively, it's yeah. kind of like synthetic control and diff and diff. 
Yeah, and, yeah. And I got some good stuff out of it. I got one pu paper published in the RAND Journal, RAND Journal of Economics, which is, you know, top field journal in IO out of that. I got um, another book chapter that just barely missed out on being in management science, especially mm. management science. Um, and, it, you know, so I, I, I wrote a few other papers on the general topic of kind of diversification and organizational structure. So mm. to go back to something you said before, I mean, I was inspired by ideas of people like Coase and Williamson and other org theorists at that time, but yeah. also some of my Austrian, you know, intuition was playing a role in that too, because I was thinking about, you know, uh, tacit knowledge that Hayek emphasized or what me, you know, Mises had written about the problem of socialist economic calculation. And now when you have, you know, one large entity that, you know, that, that lacks the information that is contained in market prices, mm. it's hard to know how to allocate resources efficiently. Mm -hmm. And so large diversified firms and large vertical, vertically integrated firms have this kind of problem too. Mm -hmm. Right, that you're you're allocating resources by managerial fiat, as Coase called it, mm -hmm. without reference to the price mechanism. Now, yeah. if you have if there's an external market for that same service or commodity, you can use that as a reference. Mm. You know, in accounting, they they call them transfer prices. Yeah, your your A division is selling to your B division. You know, selling it's not yeah. a real market transaction. It's like a it's an accounting entry. But you have to have some way, you have to have like a price or a pretend price, you know, so you can calculate like the relative profitability of each activity to decide mm -hmm. whether you want to keep it, spin it off and so forth. So yeah. you do need some access to something that looks like prices. And to me, this seemed very similar to what Mises had talked about mm -hmm. when he thought that socialist economies could not allocate resources effectively because mm -hmm. they lacked a price mechanism. So mm -hmm. I was draw some analogies there. I actually wrote a paper called, uh, the title was Socialism and the Theory of the Firm that I presented uh -huh. at Williamson's seminar uh -huh. as a grad student. And uh, I got some good comments from Williamson, even though he he didn't like it as much as I expected he would. But it's, <laughs> there was a very famous Sovietologist named Alec Nove, N-O-V-E, um, who was like a visiting scholar at that time. I, I didn't know, I, I didn't, didn't know him, but he happened to be on campus and he must've seen the title of the seminar. And he went and sat in the back of the room and he didn't say much, but then he sent me this long, like three page single spaced letter with a lot of incredibly useful suggestions and comments. And I found out later, he was like one of the world's leading experts on the Soviet economy. Uh -huh. and just like, you know, that, that's, you know, the question of where you should go to grad school. Yeah. Or you should try to work. I mean, one advantage of being at these, higher yeah. ranked places is you're more likely serendipitously to bump into somebody right you know that that you otherwise wouldn't meet totally and williamson ran a you know a seminar series with guest speakers that was phenomenal mm. i mean mm. a of nobel laureates future nobel laureates came through there herbert simon gave a talk uh you know arrow gave a talk um i'd have to dig up the list but lots of super interesting and famous people gordon tullock i remember came in one time um, and uh, once I was I was getting on the elevator and Williamson got on the elevator with another older gentleman uh, who I didn't know. And Williamson introduced me to him and I said, hello. And I made some probably completely inappropriate, smart aleck -y kind of joke. I think Williamson said, you know, this person is this very eminent sociologist. And I probably. Sorry. My bad. I accidentally was getting Alexa. Was, uh, yeah. Alexa, stop. <laughs> okay, keep going. So, so this I'm introduced to this prominent sociologist, and I probably I think I made some smart alecky remark about sociologists or something, and then later I found out it was James March, who oh. was probably at that time the most famous, you know, one of the most famous sociologists of all time. You know, he wrote that March and Simon book, that sort of foundation for behavioral economics, behavioral social science. Uh -huh. and being a snot nosed kid. You know, I didn't know who this person was. I thought I could be clever. But anyway, um, you know, interacting with people that are smarter than you yeah. and from whom you can learn something is, you know, that's important for all of us for our intellectual growth. That is an advantage of going to, you know, the best place you can go to. But there are drawbacks too. I mean, like social isolation mm -hmm. and maybe you don't do as well and maybe, you know, it's just more stressful. I mean, there are all kinds of pros and cons. So there's no, yeah. no one size fits all solutions. Sure, sure. Well, even getting mentorship, I mean, I imagine 
you can uh if you're too far away in some intellectual distance you know graph from your mentors it, you might not even necessarily be able to benefit from their guidance or you know and i think it depends on your personality type too yeah. some people are very self motivated yeah. some people need more reassurance and feedback and so that would yeah. play into the decision too yeah well, to transition a little bit, I mean, this book that you've written with Nikolai Foss, uh, Why Managers Matter, The Perils of the Bossless Company. I want to talk a little bit about this before we go. Um, a lot of what you said, I feel like I hear echoes of it, at least in a little bit of this, uh, the idea that, you know, maybe the manager is a bit of a visible hand. And so I was just kind of curious, you know, where, what is this book about and where did it come from? Yeah. So, I mean, I've written some, you know, papers over the years on different aspects of, you know, organizational design, like how should, uh, how should a company structure the hierarchy? How much, to what extent should you delegate decision authority or decentralize, you know, to lower levels of the organization? We work in an institution, the university, which really is extremely decentralized mm. in the sense that, you know, professors have a lot of autonomy in the classroom, in their research and so forth. But you can imagine, you know, uh, you know, factory work or whatever, where you have line workers and we're basically the line workers of the university, right? But imagine that you had a very, you know, defined set of responsibilities with very little latitude. You know, which of those is, which is right, which is wrong. Um, I, I've done some research in that area. But uh, a lot, along with my co-author on that book, Nikolai Foss, and, and we, uh, I, I, if I'm if I'm completely transparent with you, we we wanted to try our hand at 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 writing something on this topic that would be accessible to a general audience, mm. you know, non-specialist audience. So I knew a little bit about book publishing because uh, I published a few, Foss and I wrote an academic book in. 2002 published by Cambridge University Press and I'd written book chapters and edited some you know books for other academic publishers and I sort of knew what that was about but those kind of books you know the list price is like you know $150 yeah. on Amazon and nobody buys them except academic libraries and who right. knows how many people read them and and Nikolai and I thought you know could we write you know like what you might call a Barnes and Noble book Right, the kind of book you're, you're you're at the airport bookstore. You're looking for something to read on the plane, and there it is with all the business books. Could right. we write something in that genre? And we did, and I think it. I think we did a good job. Um, uh, we learned a lot about how that publishing market works, and we can talk about that later if you want. But so the idea was to write something that you know the typical business person could pick up and read. A manager, an entrepreneur, a student, an aspiring manager. Really, mm -hmm. anyone interested in how organizations work could understand it. And so there are a lot of examples. It doesn't use a lot of technical jargon. It's you know easy to read, which, as you know, Scott, um, that is a very difficult kind of writing yeah. for, us, for people like us. It's mm -hmm. much harder than writing an academic article. And mm -hmm. we had a very good editor. And an editor in for a trade book is not like an like a journal editor. I mean, they mm -hmm. actually edit the prose. They work yeah. with you through multiple rounds to make it more readable and to help you organize it and to help you come up with examples, blah, blah, blah. So, so uh, what, so what the book does is um, it, it's, it's a response to, or it's challenging an idea that is very popular in some segments of the, of the startup world, the tech world, um, and it's this idea that um, all organizations should be as flexible, as lean, and as flat as possible. Mm. So we're, we're addressing this idea that companies should always try to flatten the hierarchy. They should get rid of unnecessary layers of middle management. Everything should be as lean, as flex, and flexible as possible. You know, to the extent possible, every employee should have maximum autonomy mm. and freedom to make their own decisions without being constrained by some middle manager. You know, middle middle managers get a bad rap. You mm. think of like you know a Dilbert cartoon or something where you've got these productive workers, engineers or, or professors or whatever. And they're always being, you know, stymied by some associate dean or some assistant vice president for X, Y, Z. You know, the, what is it? The pointy-headed boss uh, in Dilbert who 
people don't actually contribute anything productively, but they're always sort of getting in the way. If we can yeah. get rid of these people and empower workers, then all organizations would flourish. That's mm. what we call the myth of the bossless company. The mm -hmm. myth is the idea that all companies can get better if they, you know, it, Maybe they can't be completely, literally bossless, but they can be as close to that as possible. Yeah. Where you make everything lean and flat. So, so what we argue with, um, I mean, there is a lot of academic research that underlies the ideas in the book. Mm -hmm. We don't present regression tables or anything, but we do have uh, we do footnote studies that people can refer to. But mm -hmm. we summarize some academic studies and give lots of examples and illustrations, claiming that that argument is wrong. Mm -hmm. Meaning the argument that it is always better to flatten the hierarchy is an incorrect argument. Mm -hmm. And Scott, as a distinguished academic yourself, you can immediately see the potential flaw there. I mean, we never state things in that in those kind of absolute yeah. terms. In academia, we always state them in sort of contingency language. So what we say in the book is the correct theory is, you know, uh, decentralization, delegation, empowering workers, flattening the hierarchy, making the organization more agile, whatever term you want to use, those things have some benefits, mm. right? So you can take, as Hayek put it, you can take better, uh, make better use, more effective use of decentralized, dispersed tacit knowledge. You can provide maybe better motivation for employees who are more satisfied and encouraged that they have autonomy and latitude. Um, you know, they can be more innovative in some cases when they're free to, you know, to take advantage of their own skills and exploit their own skills and form their own teams and so forth. But that kind of a model also has a number of serious drawbacks or disadvantages, namely high coordination costs or transaction costs. Yeah. Right? The left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. Yeah. The different aspects of the project don't fit. They don't coordinate well. And so you end up with a variety of kind of breakdowns from a lack of coordination among the parts. Now, mm -hmm. under what circumstances, think of this in comparative, what economists would call comparative statics terms, when are the advantages likely to outweigh the disadvantages? Well, we identify in the book key contingencies, the most important of which is what we call interdependence or interdependency among the different jobs, tasks, subunits, right? If they're mostly independent of each other, then decentralizing, flattening the hierarchy gives you all these great benefits and the costs are not that large. But mm -hmm. if you have a lot of interdependence, then decentralization is likely to bring costs that are greater than the benefits because the pieces don't fit. It's like, yeah. you know, just to give two quick examples, think about, you know, the Henry Ford's assembly line. Right? I mean, yeah, of course, of course you want to give the people at each station a little bit of latitude to uh, make adjustments to their machine and yeah, yeah, yeah. Some control over their workflow. But it can't be, be beyond a certain level. That's just going to cause problems because, you know, yeah. you need as the car bodies advance down the line, you know, the opening here has your part has to fit. The thing has to fit in the hole. Mm -hmm. Right. The pieces have to mesh together. It has to be temporally in you know synchronized otherwise yeah. you get a pile up or you get somebody waiting for the next stage to come you need mm -hmm. tight coordination you know a symphony orchestra is another example where you need tight coordination and less autonomy mm -hmm. among the different individual participants to make it work or think about higher ed i mean like i said we have a lot of autonomy and which is generally for the good but there are some coordination problems the people, any students who are listening to this will appreciate these. I always give this example with my own students. I say, have you ever been in a class where uh, the professor says, okay, well, to under, you know, to, to pass the next exam, you really need to know X, Y, Z, but you already had that in the prereq, so I don't need to cover it. Boom, and they go on to the next thing. And the <laughs> students are like, um, uh, we didn't actually get that in the prereq. Or <laughs> the professor is going on and on and on and on about something and the students raise their hand. You know, we heard this three other times in three other classes. That yeah. we did the reason we have those coordination failures is because we don't share syllabi. Right. Right. You know, we ha you don't just take a course. You, you take a sequence of courses for a major or a minor, and they're all supposed to fit together. But because at the university, we place so much emphasis on instructor autonomy, we tend to do a bad job of making a sequence of courses fit together. That's really? an example of the discoordination or coordination failure 
mm. that can arise from too much autonomy. So yeah. we wrote a book to say the guru books that say, you know, here are the five, le you know, here's the secret sauce to making your company more successful. Just do this. The guru books are always wrong yeah. because what works best for your company is always contingent on things specific to your firm, your people, your industry, your technology. And that's what we argue in the book. Yeah, sure, sure. You can hear the echoes of Coase and Williamson in that kind of thing where, I mean, you're thinking about basic ideas like the transaction costs associated with doing this on the outside changes the organization of the firm. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. That, I think that's one of the, you know, basic Coasean insight is mm -hmm. the optimal size, structure, shape, whatever. It depends on these different characteristics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Asset specificity, as Williamson called it, you know, characteristics mm -hmm. of your resources, characteristics of your people, mm -hmm. characteristics of your trading partners. You got to, the, the skill to be a good manager mm. is to identify what these contingencies are. I mean, we provide a framework. Yeah. The, ma the manager has can figure out how does this framework apply to my company, my industry, my right. business, my workers, and figure out how much flattening I want to do. It's probably not zero, mm -hmm. but it's not, you know, infinity either. Well, so with this, you know, work from home, COVID, the development of all this uh, extensive, you know, Zoom, Slack, all of this like telecommunication technologies that have allowed for worker interactions to change, what, what do you think that's done to the productivity of the manager? Yeah, I mean, on, on average... Well, it certainly changed the role of the manager in many cases, right? Because you're managing more at a distance. Yeah. Okay. But on the other hand, you do have access to some digital information that maybe yeah. you wouldn't otherwise have. Let me answer the question two ways. I mean, first, there's probably so, so work from home typically is a slightly more decentralized model than work face to face. Not in every case, but in but in many cases it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. And probably many firms, you know, the pendulum swung a little bit too far in that direction because everything was shut down, you know, for two years. Okay, now we're back in a world where you can work from home sometimes, but you don't have to. So I think a lot of firms are still figuring this out. And there are probably many uh, kinds of uh, businesses that are still a little bit too reliant on work from home. Workers have gotten used to it. You know, maybe if, if workers require this as a as a perk or a work condition, then maybe that's something you need to do to yeah. attract the people that you want to attract. But I think a lot of companies are rediscovering benefits of face to face interaction. Yeah. Certainly we have in our profession mm -hmm. right now. So finding that balance, you know, in different businesses and in different industries, I think, you know, the market is still trying to work that out. Yeah. But the second way to answer your question is to generalize it slightly to make it more about technology and digitalization. So I actually have this one uh, paper where we look at um, what we have some survey evidence from managers about how they view, you know, the access to digital tools in the workplace. Right. So the, the standard argument is because now we have, all, you know, we, we have massive amounts of data. We can track what people are doing. Uh, people don't have to be face to face. They can exchange stuff on a website. They can exchange things in email. We, 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 you know, in fact, that will lead to more delegation and more decentralization of, of many activities. But a lot of, I mean, here, here's one example we use in the book is most people talk about flattening the hierarchy. They only think about the benefits in one direction, right? So there's, there's this famous email from Elon Musk to uh, Tesla employees where he says, you know, I believe in a flatter structure. And he says, you know, anyone at Tesla should be able to talk to anyone else at Tesla, including the CEO, without having to go through a bunch of layers of management. So if you're like a low level line worker at Tesla and you've got an issue or a problem, in, in theory, you can go straight to Elon with your complaint or your suggestion without having to go through layers. And that sounds great if you're the kind of person who wants to offer a lot of suggestions. But the flip side of that, is that you know Elon Musk is also only one phone call or email away from you. <laughs> yeah. Right? You, you may not like the fact that the boss <laughs> is right there peering over your shoulder. You yeah. might prefer a few layers of middle management to be a buffer right. Right, to protect you from you know possible harm that could come from the top. Right. So the survey we did of managers in Europe showed that a lot of them uh they said that they were actually micromanaging more after they implemented, you know, digital dashboards and so forth than mm. they were before. 
like when they upgraded their ERP systems or whatever to where now I can see, I can control everything that's going on in the organization right here from my desktop. Mm. I mean, yeah, in principle, that means my workers can go off and do their thing and they don't have to wait for me to tell them what to do. But yeah. it also means I can track them in real time and know exactly what they're doing. The, 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 t the, the, the temptation to stick my nose in places where it doesn't belong may be higher than it was where I've got to go to the guy under me who goes to the gal under him and so forth until we get down to where the action is. Yeah. So having those buffering layers can be beneficial as well as potentially harmful. And yeah. we shouldn't just jump to the conclusion that we need to squeeze them all out. So digitalization, work from home, and these other innovations, they can allow for better working conditions and more autonomy and more innovation and so forth, but they can also lead to more micromanagement. Mm. Did that surprise you? Does that make a lot of sense now that you think about it? Or were, were you surprised yeah. when you started thinking about that? We were initially surprised, but I think, you know, when you think about it a little bit more, yeah. it does kind of make sense. It's like, okay, I mean, if you have, uh, you know, if you have teenagers, you yeah. can track their location on your phone. And you think, oh, well, they've got a phone now. They can, they can drive. They can go out and do their thing. I don't need to worry. But of course, I can also find out exactly where they are. Okay, who mm. are you with? Why are you there? Uh, I noticed your car has been parked here for longer than it needs to be. What's going on? Right. Which, when you and I were teenagers, our parents didn't, you know, weren't able to do that. So on yeah, balance, yeah, yeah. do teenagers have more freedom today or less freedom? I don't know. It's kind of hard to say. Right, right. Well, I kind of want to close with one thing. Uh, you know, I've heard somebody say, you know, one of the things that senior people helps with their productivity is kind of being a part of a co-author team that turns out to work really well. And and you and Nikolai Foss have become just a really, really close group, of, a, a close team of, of co-authoring. And I was curious, I mean, you know, why, why does it that you and him sort of have worked so well together and how long has that been going on? Yeah, that's a great question. He's yeah. at Copenhagen Business School. Yeah, he's at the Copenhagen Business School in Denmark, um, which is a top uh, top business school, top European business school. Um, you know, it, your observation is interesting because sometimes when uh, PhD students or junior scholars ask about, you know, how do I how do I find co-authors? How do I create that kind of a team or a, a certain kind of a, kinds of teams? If you look at the CVs of senior people, you know, a lot of times what you find is they've probably written a lot of papers and they probably have a lot of co-authors, but you'll see a lot of one-off or two-off co-authoring relationships. Yeah. And then you'll see they've written, you know, 12 papers with the same person or right. set of people. Okay. So that tells you right away, there is some experimentation mm. and, you know, we're all opportunistic to some degree. Somebody comes to you and says, Hey, I'm working, I've got this idea in mind. Would you like to work on it with me? And, you know, if you think the marginal, expected benefits that way, the marginal expected costs. You're like, yeah, I'll jump on. I'll, I'll, I'll give that a shot. But then if that co-authoring relationship only occurred once, that probably tells you the outside observer that they just didn't mesh. It didn't work for some reason. Then when you see people working together a lot, as you've just observed, okay, so there must be something going on. So what is it? I mean, he and I actually, going back to the earlier comment about community, I, I had read one or two articles that he had written when I was a very, you know, junior professor, I think he had read a couple of things that I'd written. And then we met at a conference. Actually, the greatest conference I've ever attended was the inaugural meeting of what was then called the International Society for New Institutional Economics. Oh. It was at Washington University, Washington University, St. Louis in 1997. I remember it very well because um, the speaker lineup was Ronald Coase, Douglas North, Oliver Williamson, Mansur Olson, ah. um, uh, 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 Harold Demsetz, wow. um, Paul Joskow. I mean, it was a ton and ton of super fascinating, interesting people. Yeah. Um, and and Nikolai was also at that conference. That's the first time we met face to face. Huh. And I think at that point we decided we were going to collaborate on a workshop. Like he had some funds to organize a workshop in Europe. And I was like, yeah, I want to go to Europe. I want to go to Denmark. Yeah. And so we decided to organize a, a small conference on applications of Austrian economics to issues in the theory of the firm. And uh, so we did organize a workshop in Copenhagen and a, 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 an edited volume came out of that, which I think is pretty good. And um, I don't know, we, then we, you know, started just 
to discuss other things we wanted to write and work on. And I think um, he and I have a good complementarity uh, and also a lot of things in common. I guess, you know, it's like you, you've seen these studies of diversity in teams, which yeah. show the optimal level of diversity. It's nonlinear, right? Uh -huh. If everybody's exactly the same, there's no benefit in collaboration. But if everybody's completely different, you don't speak the same language, you don't get yeah. along. So I think what that's also what you find in many co-authoring teams. Mm. Sometimes you have like a theorist and an empirical person. And, yeah. you know, the division of labor is very obvious in every paper. Right. But with 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 Foss and myself, it's not exactly like that. I think we, you know, we we have a shared in, we we share interest in the same kinds of topics. We have very similar kind of um, intellectual backgrounds. We like the same authors. We kind of speak the same language. Of course, we get along very well personally, but we're not identical. I mean, we have some differences of of opinion on you know a few core issues. I think we have just enough. There's just enough tension that the interactions lead to fruitful and useful outcomes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's it's been a very successful relationship, uh, um, you know, but I, I like to work with a variety of different different authors as, yeah. as, as does Nikolai, so. Yeah. Well, I've kept you a, a little bit over the, the top of the hour. Um, you know, I think I've told you this and then I'll say more of this in the opening, but when I went to the University of Georgia, there was like, a handful of reasons that, that I wanted to go. And, and, uh, you were one of them. It was a bummer that you were leaving right when I got there, but I've, okay. I've really enjoyed having you come back, come back around the, the universe correcting itself. And then we're both at Baylor. <laughs> yeah. I was so excited when I uh, found about, I found out about this position at Baylor. I don't know if you remember, I think I emailed you and said, yeah, hey, yeah. Um, there's a job at Baylor. Well, you know, tell me about, tell me about this place. Cause I was thinking, Oh, that'd be great to get back. As you said, we just missed each other at Georgia, but this was a chance to get that alignment the way it, the way right. it should be. But, uh, right. I, I, you know, you're the only person I knew. Well, I mean, I, there were, I had some other acquaintances yeah. and the people who were recruiting me in entrepreneurship, I knew casually. But yeah. the only person I felt like I could say, okay, what's it really like to work there was you. And so you yeah. gave me some good advice. <laughs> well, it was really, I've been really enjoying having you, having you here. It's really wonderful. Well, I've really loved getting to hear your story and to talk to you and to hear uh, all of your thoughts about your career and, and uh, economics and entrepreneurship. I really appreciate you being on the, on the, on the show. Yeah. Thanks for the invitation. I've enjoyed the conversation and uh, happy to chat at any time. Okay. All right. Well, I'll talk to you later. I'll see you around. Right. Right.